and that's where we're going to start is the left side of the palette so that we've started at the top so that we can keep the side of our hand the side of our hand out of the paint also if you are left-handed right-handed you know we're not going to judge anybody by what colors are where so um, what we're doing is we're trying to learn how to wake that color up put it over on your tray and pick it up and then just go over here and put it on your palette and that's what i'd like for you to do there's supposed to be 10 wells there are 10 wells here and 10 wells here so that's 20 wells i have 21 colors on here because this one i have two and we will put two in there if, if you leave room for it so now then i'm going to clean my brush so if you all have done that one and if anytime you want to just watch you'll be able to catch up so don't worry about it now then i'm going to come over here so the first color i put down was green gold the next color i'm putting down is called new gamboge and it is the one that i call electric yellow it's so much fun to paint with because it does so many things to colors when you paint them or mix them together the next color is yellow okra <laughs> and it's an earth tone and it yep. has kind of a dull finish yes uh -huh. how much water are you putting to wake up just like a drop i put two drops and it seems kind of watery so i want to make sure i'm well if you have two drops you um um half it has if you have two drops it either is sitting water on top and or and it's only soaked into a place that's why rubbing the color is uh -huh. the best way to wake that color up instead of doing the drops and so you can just oh, rub okay. that color and pick that color up on your palette on your brush and come over there and put it down and then wipe your brush keep your brush from getting too wet so this this practice of doing this over and over and over again you're going to learn what is on your brush because you're going to get better about rubbing that color putting it down and picking it up wiping the brush off cleaning the brush making sure the brush is not too wet come back over here and rub your color again and put it down and pick it up I mean, clean the brush off. And then we don't want to go back into your color with a wet brush. You want to wipe that brush off. And it doesn't matter whether it's a regular paintbrush or a water brush. Kathleen, can you say what colors you're doing as you go? Just because I'm having trouble differentiating the colors, the dark yes. colors. Uh huh. Okay, so we have um, we have first one is green gold, and then new gamboge, and then yellow okra, and then thalo turquoise, then quinacridone violet, and then perylene green. And perylene green does not look green. Sometimes it really looks black when you put it down, but it's a wonderful, wonderful green. And Gorgeous. then, uh, then uh, sap green, and that's as far as I've gone. And I'm going to stop for a few minutes until. This is fun. Kathleen, in one of your videos, you actually have the template, which I've been using as using. my reference. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, so that, and that is the download, the PDF downloaded. Right. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So I, I like having that out when I do my paint so I can remember the colors too. Yeah. Right. Learning right. And sometimes you never see these colors by themselves. You know, like this may be the only time you really get to know these colors. Um, 
by the, itself is by putting it on this palette. But I do color charts over and over and over again to become familiar with colors and how to, you know, how I want to mix them and how what I want to do with them. So uh, this is one of my favorite things. And Bobby, you saying it is fun is is wonderful. Um, so um, so the next color I'm going to do is opera pink. And opera pink is to me a really really strange color. Um, it um, uh, is kind of unlike anything else. After you really wake it up, it's a real neon pink, and it takes a lot to wake it up. And you all, you've seen me come over here on the tray sometimes, and night like right now with the opera pink, I'm coming here on the tray. That's because it just is hard to bring that pigment to the surface, and that's why we have to rub it. Is um, and there's some colors that are just like that. And it doesn't matter whether it's Daniel Smith color or Windsor Newton or Windsor Newton Cotman, or um, I mean, there's there's hundreds of different brands that we could be using. So right now I feel like I pretty much have all the color I can get. And I am going to take this brush right over here instead of you know, worrying about how much water on it is on it or anything. And I'm going to just put that color down and you can see, fully appreciate opera pink that way. Opera pink is so transparent, such a transparent color. It's wonderful to mix with other colors. And that, that right there is like, if I was writing a book, that would be a tip at the bottom of this page is transparent colors are easy and wonderful to mix with other colors. And the reason is, is because it is transparent and it's gonna mix with whatever pigments you give it to mix with. So um, quinacridone colors are all transparent colors and then outside of that you have to learn what colors are really transparent by using them and so the quinacridones that we've used so far the only one is is the violet quinacridone violet right here and that's actually the only quinacridone color on the left hand side of my palette but we know for a fact that this one right here is real transparent and this one is real transparent just because I've, I've used it a lot. It's not because it's a quinacridone. New Gamboge is actually very transparent. It's one of the reasons why it mixes really well. Um, green Gold is very transparent. Um, yellow Okra is not. None of the earth tones are very transparent. Thalo colors are transparent, but they are not as transparent as quinacridone. Sap green is very transparent. Um, the, you know, in other words, it doesn't, it's, it's the characteristic of the pigment rather than the name or the classification of what it's made from. So now then this color is called transparent brown oxide. It is transparent. It is oxide, which I don't know what that means, but most oxide colors in today's world are not transparent. And that's why it is part of the name, is to give the indication, to let you know that it is a transparent color. So I'm cleaning my palette, my brush, drying it off, and I'm going to come over here. This is the only black on my palette right here, and it's called Lunar Black, and it's very granulating. It will go solid black, but for the biggest part, it's got some transparency, and it has some 
uh, separation in it. I think lunar black is one of the most fun colors I, I paint with when I need a color to do what it does. So I'm coming over here onto a sheet of paper and I'm, I painted what else was on my, my brush and I'm going to separate this, you know, more water, just to add that water to it. And can you all see the separation that's beginning to happen in some of yeah. the that is what they mean by granulation. This would always look like some of the part particles did not um, actually dissolve. And that's what the um, granulation is, is something inside of the color that will not dissolve completely. Kathleen? Yes. Can I get your thoughts on ivory black? Um, you know, honestly, at least I've used it very seldom. Um, uh, lamp black has always been, uh, I think ivory black was probably one that they introduced to try to get into like a neutral black. Um, but I'm not real sure about that. Um, do you tell me what you think of it? I I have it, but I haven't really used it. I mean, I, I know it is warmer than lamp black or uh -huh. lunar black, but I just don't. I haven't heard an, anyone really talk about it or why they use it or not use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't um, know if it's just an old school black, maybe. I, I don't know. Yes, it is probably definitely an old school black. Um, you know, it's considered to be transparent. Um, but, it, you know, which I should expect this of something that's considered to be transparent, but I don't think you can ever make it really black. That's what, I, and maybe that's where it comes up with the name of ivory black. And that's why I said it's kind of a precursor to Daniel Smith's neutral. Um, you know, the, um, I, I would not have a use for it in my palette, um, myself. I mean, that's, that's why I like indigo in my palette is that's, that's my neutral is, um, is mixing it, but good question. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm going to clean my palette now, and, um, this is probably pretty close to dry. But we're going to go ahead and build the rest of, of this palette. And um, so I'm going to take my Hansa Yellow Light. Hansa Yellow comes in light, medium, and deep, I think, rather than dark. I think it says deep. And um, But it is the yellow that I choose to have, the true yellow that I choose to have on my palette. Um, the hands of yellow light is. So I've just put that down in the first uh, little tray there and um, I'm gonna move on. So it's to me a very good primary yellow. Now then I'm gonna wake up. This is quinacridone red. Quinacridone red starts out a beautiful rose pink color and I want to be able to show both right here. But right now, I'm going to put down whatever is on my brush and that I'm going to be happy with. Because if I want it darker, I have to let that dry and go do another layer on it to really bring out the red, red of quinacridone red. And, um, you know, so red is not just red and it's not necessarily just pink um i mean it doesn't start out pink as a wash um if you look at the color name on your printer your um you know computer printers and um i can't think of what the laser printers or the or the um the other one um pink jet. it is magenta and so honestly, to mix magenta 
with blue and yellow as the primary colors is more correct than to say red. So, you know, we say we communicate red is the primary red, but in every one of our printer, printers, we use a primary red and it is magenta. So just go figure. That's just a point of uh, education there that, um, you know, everything is not, um, you know, as it seems, I guess, is... Um, you know, when I was trying to come up with a palette that um, was right for every student to learn on, I wanted my red to start out pink and be able to build on it, just like the, the printer does. So um, the next color on my palette is called Manganese Blue Hue. Now, I use manganese blue hue because, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, well, I use manganese blue hue in this palette instead of cerulean. And the reason is, is because manganese blue hue is harder to wake up. It's actually a hue color instead of the original manganese. And that's because we've run out of the uh, base of manganese and so we had to chemically come up with something that would do pretty much the same thing now back probably in the early 60s maybe 70s we had a lot of manganese colors and it was because the automobile industry was using it but when they stopped it became too expensive to have and that's when they came up with the hue. So that is what motivates the art industry is not being able to get it or being able to get it from the automobile industry. And I think manganese blue is absolutely a beautiful, beautiful blue. It's been totally practically replaced with cerulean. And, um, and so I, in honor of manganese blue, I put it on my, my palette. And you can see how transparent it is. They did a beautiful job of coming up with a hue that was like manganese blue. And um, this is a color that you can mix your quinacridone red with, or a little bit of a purple or another blue and have magnificent skies so um, that's the biggest reason and you don't have to work very hard for it to be a wash it comes off the palette as a wash I know I'm teaching you all so much about every one of these colors but that's why we have uh, videos so now then this color is a thalo color thalo blue red shade that's kind of a hint that there's also thalo blue green shade. There's also um, thalo yellow green. There's also thalo yellow. I mean, there's just thalos just go on and on and on. The only real characteristic that is consistent with all the thalo colors is that it's very easy to wake up and they are very strong colors. If you want to paint them as a wash, they take a lot of water. So I'm going to clean my brush. I'm going to come over here and get some water and I'm going to put it on this palette. And you can see it's really goes, you know, just keeps on being. So we'll come over here where the water wasn't. And, you know, there's a lot of color in both of those brush strokes. And I don't, it doesn't matter what's on your palette here as much as it is that you understand how that is a characteristic of it. Now, the other thalo color we've used is thalo turquoise. And it is just, you know, you just barely touch it. That color is right there. It's awake and ready to be color painted in a very, very strong color. So I just put that down on my palette. And, um, um, I'm going to clean my palette now because that's what I do to keep from making messes mainly. 
Um, but also, as you paint this way, you're going to find out that your your tray stains. It's not going to be a stain that will come off on another color if you will clean your palette just with water and go on. If you ever come in here and you put bleach on your palette to get it really clean, that bleach is going to stay in that plastic and affect the, the colors you put on top of it for some time. You can rub this color off if you want. But that's just not necessary. It is not transferring it to the other color. So just kind of get used to that um, stain that's on a plastic palette. Artists have a tendency over the years of porcelain is our choice of palettes. Porcelain is heavy. It breaks. It's There's a lot of reasons to become fond of the plastics. So now then I'm going to go to probably one of my most favorite colors and that's Carbazole Violet. And Carbazole Violet has a color called Dioxazine Purple in it and that's what makes it so strong is that Dioxazine Purple. And if you look on your tube you can find out if your purple has Dioxazine Purple in it. And that's a pretty good indication that it's really, really dark. Now, I like to add a little bit of water to this so I can really see that it's purple right here on the palette. And, um, and I know that the light does not transfer just really well for you all. So it's possible that you don't see that, that purple like I do. And I will point out that some of the colors that I have on this left side are in proximity to what's in the right side. So right here, I have a real yellow green. In fact, in, in the um, there's a, a computer reading that tells tells us a lot about colors, like how the eye sees colors, and this green is way over in the yellow. It, it doesn't register as a green. And so I have my yellows right here at the top. Then I have a blue, it's thalo turquoise, but it is a blue, which it lines up a little bit with my blues over here. And then I have a reddish purple, which lines up with the purple on the right hand side. So those are some hints, some ways that you can begin to learn your palette is become familiar with what has been placed on the other side of it. And so now then we're getting into the, um, the purple is a secondary color. So are the greens, so are the oranges. So the next color we're gonna do is Thalo yellow green. Thalo yellow green has, um, you know, it has properties. It looks a little bit neon to the eye, but it is not. It's, it's just a very good traditional um, plant color. Um, you know, if we if you ever read the word local color, we're talking about a leaf is leaf's local color is green. You can paint any leaf phthalo yellow green and you will be right. And if you want to make it a little more autumn green or spring green, it's spring green, you just do two layers of phthalo yellow green. If you want to make it towards go towards autumn, you could use a little bit of orange in it or, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do with it. Um, so I'm going to slow down and make sure that y'all are caught up with me because this next green, this may be the only time you find yourself painting it. Um, um, I mean, I hope not, but I do kind of stay away from it for, for specific reasons. And um, um, I'd like to teach you that. 
So I'm, I am taking a pause. Does anybody have any questions so far that... Um, uh, I still haven't learned how to ask that question right. Um, I'd love to hear your questions. How's that? <laughs> That's, yes. On your, on your recordings, do you have um, like this color, uh, oh. something with colors? Or is this a good one just to watch a repeat for the color theory? I mean, for the colors on your ballot. Um, this uh, this will be probably the best one I've ever done. I've never used this painting as uh, my introductory. Uh, we've always just done a color chart and then done a painting mm -hmm. before. And so I'm really trying to incorporate all of it in it. And then we'll come over here and use some of the colors and it'll be... So Callie, are you painting with us? <laughs> yeah, is it, it, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I and it got, got good colors. I don't think I'm putting enough water in because mine aren't turning out blurry like yours. Oh yeah, no, this is, we have a tendency to paint as if it's oil paint, you know, really grab a lot of color and put it down. There's not a right or wrong with this. This is just a good place to start and begin to really, really, um, you know, learn the, um, basically learn what's on your palette. And it wouldn't matter, you know, what it, it what um, the, um, what the specific color is, you need to learn those colors you need to learn oh my gosh I got too much of that oh my gosh if I put my brush back in that I could probably paint an elephant with it you know I mean it just um, they all have a lot of characteristics and it's true you can mix a color that you can't get rid of you've got so much of it um, and it's a good idea to know why those things happen um, well, like my purple on the left and my purple on the right in yours, you can really see the distinction between the reddish purple and in mine, they look very similar. Uh -huh. I don't know why that is, but. Um, you know, uh, I do make mistakes. <laughs> and um, I I've been known to. Oh, they, they look different in the palette, but on my paper, they didn't look all that different. <laughs> okay, yes, it, it could without enough, without without enough water they can definitely look very very but that's a good example too of um you know learning what you expect from it too you so know can I go back and with a wet brush kind of move it around a little or is that not a good idea not I, let's not do idea? that let's not do that right now but we will I mean just because you'll you'll get wet and if we want to make it darker and some of it yeah. But just um, leave it, leave it like it is right now. And so now I'm going to move on. These last colors right here um, all have a lot of, you know, conversation I can give to them or not. So, but we do want to paint the bird and we want to get farther along. And I've just taken up an hour of your time. So um, I want to be respectful of that. And if there's anybody that needs to leave, Please know that the video is available to you, and I really, really appreciate your time. And um, and you know, say bye. And and um, if we could share um, the paintings, if it's later on, you know, first, I would love that. So this green is called Serpentine Genuine. Daniel Smith has a line of paint that is from minerals. Um, a lot of the car manufacturer colors that are really, really um, uh, unique, um, you know, when they come out with new colors and things have been colors that were mined, that were created out of something that is mined. Um, so when they come out with those new colors and you find out everything that's in them, you will hear some of the names that are in this line that Daniel Smith created with the minerals. 
and serpentine genuine is one of them and serpentine i mean you know if if you're a geologist you might know what states i know california has a lot of serpentine but anyway this is a beautiful color if i was going to paint on location um in uh kind of fall fall time this would be a green i would use real consistently this green separates if you have a lot of it with a lot of water and you get a red you actually see red in the green and i don't know if you realize it but green our green earth the things that you look at outside have a lot of red in it even in the springtime you can see a lot of red once yeah. you've really developed an eye to see those colors in nature and serpentine genuine gives you that um, that opportunity so one of the other characteristics of the um, colors that were made from minerals is um, they're all hard to wake up so you have to treat them kind of like an earth tone and give it lots of water and let it sit for just a minute. And then if you go right back into the color, that is when you're able to pick up what it really is designed to do. And, and so that's what I've done, y'all. There's some sheen on it. But when this dries, I won't be surprised to see some red in it. The other character, the other, it, this isn't characteristic, but every single one of the mineral colors are named genuine at the end. So whatever, rodenite genuine is a red, um, they all have genuine at the end of the, of the name. So if you're at Michael's looking at the little display they have of Daniel Smith watercolor paint, and you see a color that says genuine on it, that's what you're looking at is one of the um, um, colors that are made with, uh, with minerals. And it's fascinating because, um, or it's fascinating to me, when I have done demonstrations for Daniel Smith at, um, you know, like the trade shows, um, um, John, the owner of Daniel Smith, brings with him all of the minerals, the actual rock. And it's a lot of fun to see, um, um, you know, these, these large minerals that he carries with him to these shows and, um, and become familiar with them. I, I didn't do very well in science, and so that's not something that I learned very much about um, and um but i love learning about it with the paint so now i'm i clean my palette again and we're gonna now then this is called permanent orange permanent orange all the permanent colors you put your brush in you get it moist and you get the same color you would if you if you went right into this color in other words what he is here is the same as what's here. I can add water to it all day long and it'll thin out a lot, but the color itself stays the same. And since I have two colors on this little tray right there, I am gonna just paint a little bit of it. I'm gonna wipe my brush now and I'm gonna very quickly come over here and get what's called organic vermilion. Organic vermilion is um, just organic vermilion. It uh, is a bright reddish orange and it mixes beautifully with orange. It is transparent enough to do an airy poppy with it. Um, it, um, uh, the, um, um, the um yes thank you um and um thank you claire the um um possibilities are endless with organic vermilion the um you know mixing power the brightness of it 
the reason it's on my palette though because you could do that very the all the things i've mentioned with a lot of other colors this is what a lot of the kits that you buy that have all the colors pre um chosen a lot of if you you know if you buy a palette of colors or a travel kit or anything this is the color that they call red and that is leaves a lot to be desired in my opinion and so that is why I put this color in there to use it yes but also to say to you that's one of the reasons why we choose our own color palette is that that is not a primary red in any way shape or form it will never come close to it won't satisfy that at all and um, so now then quinacridone burnt orange and if you live in Texas, yes no i was just saying yay i love you and oh. i use that color to <laughs> yeah. me Yes, uh, quinacridone bird orange, and that was somebody from Washington State that said yay, and I'm getting ready to say, if you live in Texas and you live close to um, University of Texas in Austin, quinacridone bird orange doesn't exist for anything except to be on a longhorn to be <laughs> a Texas longhorn color. I was about to ask if that was your longhorn color. <laughs> That's funny. Pokemon. But you thought it, didn't you? I did, yes. Uh -huh. So now then, I'm just going to come over here. I got to say gigum right here. Sorry. <laughs> Good for you. That's the Aggie in the group. <laughs> so um, the um, and it's just I. It is. It's a very wonderful color to to work with. So now then I'm going to clean my palette again, and this is to do our last color on the palette, and that is indigo. And um, indigo is just absolutely a wonderful, wonderful, very dark blue. Uh, Payne's gray is supposed to be like this. Um, um, nothing quite works as well as indigo for the purposes that I use it. 